In this lecture, we're going to be talking about Rome's efforts to conquer the Mediterranean. We'll begin by looking at the battle at Cannae, and in particular at the reaction of the Italic allies to Rome's defeat there. And then look at Rome's invasion of Africa after Cannae, an invasion that culminates in the Battle of Zama and Hannibal's eventual exile. And then finally, we'll conclude by looking at Rome's presence in Spain after the Punic War and in the years following. So the battle at Cannae, this is dated to 216 BC, and it was a monumental moment in Roman history. It was a moment when the consuls decided that the tactics that Fabius Maximus had been advocating, these skirmish tactics that we talked about in the previous lecture, were going to be abandoned. So Fabius had been advocating a kind of skirmish warfare rather than face-to-face -face combat, um, pitched battle. This had been somewhat successful, but it was very different from the kind of battle that Rome was used to fighting. It wasn't the typical kind of warfare, and it was seen as lacking courage, as being kind of a wimpy way to fight, as it were. Um, and so in the face of Hannibal's march, Further south into Italy, um, remember that the Roman forces had been really routed in the north at Trebia and Lake Trasimene in the, in the couple of years previous to 216, in 217 and 218 BC. They now encounter Hannibal in the south, and it's at Cannae that the two forces meet. And in the map that's on your slide, on the left hand side of your slide, you can see the arrow pointing to where Cannae is. Um, it's on the eastern side of the Apennines, quite a bit south um, of Rome. So not particularly an area that was going to threaten Rome directly, but it was very important in terms of Rome's allies in Campania. Um, it was very important that Rome managed to quell Hannibal's march south. Um, one of the big risks here is that Hannibal is going to take control of southern Italy, that particularly southern Italy um, and even Latium would come under control of Hannibal and really become a another um, Carth Carthaginian outpost. Um, so at Cannae, the Romans do face-to-face -face battle with the Carthaginian forces, and they're soundly defeated. In fact, it's it's a it's a horrible bloodbath. Um, 80,000 Romans are killed, including one of the consuls and a third of the senators. So one of the things that is somewhat unusual, I think, to, to a modern student of Roman history is the fact that you have high-profile leaders actually out on the battlefield. So we're kind of used to even um, generals really working from behind the scenes and giving orders to the soldiers, but not themselves leading the charge. Um, but this is really a situation where you have the consuls leading the army and a number of senators out on the battlefield, and it's part of how they, in a sense, make their bones. Um, it's how they show that they're worthy for office. Um, they want to be able to brag about their courageous um, acts and, and bravery um, in the face of danger when they run for election. Um, and so they, in order to do this, they need to actually be out there fighting. Um, and of course, this means that they risk death. And so we end up at Cannae with a third of the senators dying. Um, this is an enormous loss for Rome's ruling class, and it will have ramifications for generations to follow. The other important thing that happens after the massive defeat at Cannae is that Rome's allies down in, Camp in Campania start to defect, um, even before Cannae. They had been defecting to Hannibal, either by offering troops or sometimes just by offering supplies. Um, Hannibal had been able to, to rely on these kinds of defections throughout his march south um, from the Alps, but where it really gains power is down in Campania. Um, and there, this really becomes a fight for control of Campania and the cities down there. The Carthaginians would love to have a strong presence in um, southern Italy. So when these allies begin to defect, Rome is not in much of a position to really enforce the agreements that they had made, and it's a, it's a, it's a serious problem. 
um, if they're not able to regain control of these allied cities down in Campania. So here we have a um, painting that shows um, what, um, at least in one artist's imagination, the Roman slaughter at Cani looked like. Um, you can see lots of, of dead people lying, um, the Carthaginian forces on horses, um, it's dead Romans down at the bottom of the screen. But this was really, for the Romans, probably the most memorable defeat on the field until they get to late antiquity. Um, to the fourth century. Um, so, and it was a battle that was often cited, um, remembered as remember what happened at Cani, remember when we were um, not prepared to fight our enemy. So after Cani, um, sort of Fabius's skirmish tactics now become the obvious choice. So in essence, the Romans had to see just how badly their typical mode of warfare was going to fare against the Carthaginian forces before they recognized that perhaps it would be a good idea to adopt the skirmish tactics that Fabius had been advocating and that had been successful when they were used. Um, and so now the Romans no longer try to engage Carthaginian forces in pitched battle. They don't meet them at some place and actually fight a battle. Um, in fact, what they try to do is cut off supply lines. They sort of nag them, they raid their camps, they basically engage in annoying them and in inhibiting progress. Um, they also spend considerable amount of energy resources trying to recapture their allies. Um, they recognize that this is almost as important as defeating Hannibal's forces, um, and in some ways realize that they may not ever fully defeat Hannibal, that, that his forces are simply superior at this point, particularly after Cani when the Roman military has been really um, um, watered down. I mean, they've lost a tremendous number of men. Some of those have been replaced. They hold additional levies and get more citizen soldiers into the army, but it's very difficult to replace, for instance, the senators that died that were the leaders. Um, and so they make a real effort to try to recapture certain cities, in particular Syracuse, Capua, and Tarentum. And Livy, in fact, tells us the stories of Rome's efforts to recapture um, these, these cities that had defected. Um, and then the punishments that the Roman, the, the Roman army um, exacts on these cities, particularly the leading citizens. Um, Rome had no problem ordering the execution of the leaders of these cities, of throwing the entire city population into slavery, um, selling them off um, to get money. So Rome wasn't particularly um, merciful when they were dealing with these, these defectors. They manage also using these skirmish tactics to drive Hannibal down into the very far south of Italy. So he's down in the heel of the boot um, in a place that's called Brutium. Um, he's basically hemmed in now by the Roman army. So they can't defeat him, but what they can do is just prevent him from going anywhere. Um, the only place he has to go is to get on a ship and sail back to Carthage um, or try to move further north. But again, these skirmish tactics are quite effective in inhibiting any kind of progress north. Um, Hannibal made a big mistake after Cani in not actually turning north um, to Rome and trying to sack the city of Rome. He pauses, he enjoys life down in southern Italy. Um, clearly his men were tired, it was a long um, campaign, but he should have built on that victory and really sort of gone after the heart of, of Rome, that is the city itself. And he doesn't do this, and historians will comment, including Livy, that this was in fact the big mistake of his campaign in the Second Punic War. Um, he ends up hemmed in down in southern Italy with nowhere to go. Um, and also with his supply lines really being cut off, um, thanks to the skirmish tactics advocated by Fabius. Um, his brother-in-law Hasdrubal, um, who has been fighting in Spain and engaging with Roman forces in Spain, tries to bring in reinforcements, but is in fact defeated and killed in battle there. So that's another important um, event that happens that really prevents Hannibal from making a, a concerted march north um, from Brutium. 
He doesn't really have any supplies. The allied cities that had defected to him have been punished, have been turned back, at least under their, they've been returned to the control of Rome. So Hannibal really doesn't have a, anywhere to go and any way to keep his men supplied, um, simply with food and with um, replacement armor, things like that. At this time, the Roman presence in Spain um, it turns into a serious effort. So they had been engaging with Hasdrubal's forces there, um, but not in a, the, most of the, the, the battle with the Carthaginians was happening in Italy. And most of the resources that Rome had were being devoted to the Italian forces rather than the forces that were in Spain dealing with Hasdrubal. But in 206 now, they turn their attention to Spain. Um, and once they've routed the, Ca the Carthaginian forces in Spain, start to make plans to move into North Africa um, to wage war directly on Carthage. So in 204 then, Scipio, um, who is pictured on the left-hand side of your screen, this is a coin showing um, Scipio in profile, um, Scipio leads the Roman troops to North Africa. So this is when the, the Roman army really goes on, on the, the, um, the aggressive. They, they really are making an effort now to defeat Carthage. Um, so they've been on the defensive um, for really about close to 15 years um, as Hannibal was making his way through Italy. But having hemmed Hannibal in in the south, he's got nowhere to go. Um, he can't really make war anymore. He's been disarmed in some really basic sense. Now the Romans realize in order to finally um, get rid of this Carthaginian threat, they need to go to Carthage itself. Um, and so Scipio and his troops land just north of Carthage um, at a city called Utica. Um, good name to remember. It's going to come back up um, in our, in our uh, narrative of Roman history. Um, Utica is an old Phoenician uh, colony, just like Carthage itself was. It's even older than Carthage, um, located just to the north. Um, so it's a good landing spot to um, disembark your troops, get them all ready to actually make a march into Carthage itself. Um, the Romans also, when they get to Africa, um, make an important alliance. Um, and this alliance is with the leader of the Numidians. Um, Numidia was essentially a native settlement, was a settlement that existed long before Carthage, um, where native Berbers um, are, are found um, and had a very complex, um, uneasy relationship with Carthage, particularly as Carthage expanded. Um, it was taking up Numidian territory. And these are two cities that don't get along very well. And so Massinissa, the leader of the Numidians, recognizes an opportunity. Um, he recognizes that he can ally himself and his people with the Roman forces to take down Carthage and that this will actually be good for the Numidians. Um, and so this is how the Romans end up defeating um, the Carthaginians um, with the, the help of um, the Numidian forces and with Massinissa. And again, Massinissa is a figure that's going to come back up in our narrative, good to remember his name. Hannibal now, who's been stuck in Southern Italy, is actually recalled to Africa by the Carthaginian Senate to deal with the Romans. They recognize that the hopes of taking over Italy, of establishing a permanent Carthaginian presence in especially southern Italy, are probably dashed at this point. And that now it's really about defending the homeland. Um, and so they want their great general Hannibal back home, leading the army in um, North Africa. So everything between the Romans and the Carthaginians comes to a head at the Battle of Zama. Um, and in 202 BC, Scipio, together with the Numidian allies, defeats Hannibal and the Carthaginian forces at Zama. Um, Zama is a, um, it was basically a settlement outside of Carthage, um, it was an open plains, um, and they fight in pitched warfare, but this time the Roman army is successful, um, is able to, to outmaneuver the Carthaginian forces 
and defeat Hannibal on his own territory. And in 201 BC, then, they negotiate a peace settlement. And the terms of surrender are incredibly punitive. Um, the Carthaginians really get the short end of the stick in this. Um, they're not in a position to negotiate a particularly favorable settlement. Um, but the Romans demand and receive the surrender of the fleet. So in essence, the Carthaginian fleet now is given over to the Romans. Um, this severely inhibits not just their ability to make warfare, but also their ability to trade, um, to engage in any kind of trade. So part of the problem now is that Carthage itself is not a particularly wealthy place. They depend on engaging in trade with other cities, and they depend on having forces, having a presence, particularly in Spain and in southern um, Italy, down in Sicily and Sardinia. Um, these, this was where they got a lot of their wealth, um, particularly through minerals, and um, they were mining minerals. And by having to surrender their fleet, they're now no longer able to draw on those sources of wealth. They're also required to make an extremely large payment. Um, and this payment will really cripple their ability to recover from the Second Punic War. And finally, they're forbidden to wage war without the permission of the Romans. So anytime they want to even defend their own city, they have to ask for permission from the Romans. This will be a big issue when it comes to the Third Punic War, and again, I promise that will be the last one. But one of the issues there is the fact that they're being harassed by Massinissa, and they're not able to respond. Um, and the fact that Massinissa has this alliance with the Romans really puts the Carthaginians um, at a at a um, in an unfortunate position. And so that the events there are going to eventually lead to um, the Romans or to the Carthaginians finally deciding they've had enough and wage and trying to protect their city against the Numidians. And the Romans will then use that as an excuse to get involved um, once again in a conflict with the Carthaginians. Um, it was at this point after the Second Punic War that Carthage was severely crippled and really was no longer a Mediterranean power. And this is a, a, a hugely important event, um, particularly when one thinks that it was not, it, it, it was less than 20 years pre previously that Hannibal and the Carthaginian forces had absolutely smashed the Romans at Cani. Um, and so now, you know, 15 years later, they, Carthage has been completely disarmed. It's unable to compete militarily or economically. Um, and so an incredible turn of events, and one that is in, has incredible significance also for the development of Rome. Hannibal himself, in the aftermath of Zama, becomes a statesman, um, and he's really his, his skills as a military general are now put to use in trying to help Carthage recover from the Second Punic War, and especially from this very punitive peace treaty that they was essentially forced on them. Um, he, in fact, becomes quite unpopular. Um, from what we can tell, this is partly because he, in order to raise money for paying off this indemnity, this large payment, and to try to do it as quickly as possible, he argues that the, the richest citizens of Carthage should be paying a large percentage of this, that there should be a, basically a tax placed on them. This doesn't make them very happy. These rich citizens are the senators um, in Carthage. They're not real happy with Hannibal trying to take their money away. This is a familiar story um, that even, even we moderns can recognize. And Hannibal eventually becomes a kind of outcast among the Carthaginian elite. And they even start to um, secretly plan to hand him over to the Romans. Hannibal catches wind of this plan and gets on a boat and flees Carthage for the east. Um, he ends up as far east as Bithynia, um, so this is quite a distance away. Um, and you can look at a map in your textbook um, to see where Bithynia is. But really, he gets out of town in a, in a big way, um, very far away from the Romans. Um, he's well outside, really, even of, of Roman control. 
Um, and once he's over in Bithynia in Asia Minor, he starts to engage in a variety of political um, negotiations. He is an incredibly useful um, statesman in even Bithynia. But once again, he sort of ends up on the wrong side of things and catches wind that he's about to be handed over to the Romans. Um, the Romans really want to get their hands on Hannibal. Um, in part, they hope to be able to march him in a military triumph and to show their their victory over this, this um, frightening enemy of Rome. Um, and so they'd really love to get their hands on Hannibal, show him off, show their, in a, in a display, show their superiority over Hannibal, and then kill him. Hannibal knows this is what's going to happen. He's not interested in, in being put on display as um, an object of Roman superiority, Roman dominance. Um, he ends up committing suicide, um, and this is about 182 BC. Um, so in the end, Hannibal, having lived a glorious life, um, commits a kind of noble suicide. Um, he prefers to protect himself from this, this really sort of ignoble end um, in, in the custody of the Romans. And here you have a representation of Hannibal. Um, he's, the Romans are trying to break in. You can see on the left-hand side of the screen, you have an attendant at the door trying to keep um, the Roman from coming in, and Hannibal with a cup of poison in his hand, in the guise really actually of a philosopher. I mean, this is very reminiscent of um, Socrates um, drinking the hemlock. So after the Second Punic War, one of the consequences is that Rome now essentially is in control of Spain. Um, they have kicked out the Carthaginian forces, and Spain has a lot to offer, but it's pretty far away from Rome. It would be difficult to administer. Um, the various um, native groups in the Iberian Peninsula aren't super happy about coming under anybody's control. They'd been exploited already by the Carthaginians. Um, much of the, their wealth, particularly mineral wealth, had been taken away. So the idea of now coming under the control of the Romans isn't something that many of the cities in the Iberian Peninsula are eager to embrace. Rome itself is also not sure what it wants to do, and there are a variety of opinions um, being offered in the Roman Senate. So one of the options is just simply to leave, to withdraw forces and let the Iberian Peninsula govern itself. Um, this would certainly be one possibility. It would save the Romans a lot of resources. So it was very expensive to try to govern the Iberian Peninsula when Rome is already devoting substantial resources to just consolidating its gains in Italy itself, making sure that those allies both in southern Etruria and in Campania stay loyal. Um, these are territories that Rome really needs to have under its control very solidly, um, but also Sicily and Sardinia. And it gets substantial wealth from particularly Sardinia. So the idea of trying now to administer the Iberian Peninsula is something that there's a lot of, of back and forth about. Um, certainly they had no interest in having a permanent presence in Carthage. Um, they imposed a peace settlement on Carthage that was, as I said, very punitive, but there's no permanent Roman presence, military presence, in North Africa. And there's plenty of opposition to having a permanent presence in Spain as well. Um, there's also some talk about what do you do with those cities that allied themselves with Carthage um, and that may continue to feel some loyalty to their previous Carthaginian masters. Um, so it's, it's a complex situation, and the Romans aren't entirely sure what they want to do about it. Um, we do know sort of over time that a Roman presence was maintained, that there was an effort to establish um, what were called provinces, um, basically regions of governance that had Roman magistrates in charge of them in the Iberian Peninsula, um, particularly in areas that were no less hostile um, to Roman incorporation. War veterans were settled there, and there was a substantial amount of intermarriage with local women that then produced Roman citizens. Um, these, these 
cities that were incorporated were given citizenship, and so the offspring of the war veterans were Roman citizens now. Um, and it, one of the benefits of having some military presence in Spain was exactly that you could take land and give it to war veterans. As we'll see through the next several lectures, one of the major problems in the period after the Second Punic Wars and really throughout the Republic is this issue of what do you do with war veterans? They've left their land. Um, oftentimes, by this point, they didn't have any land to start with. But after they've served gloriously in the army, one of the things that they're promised is a plot of land to farm. And generals need to find this. Um, this is something that the, the consuls, as generals, are in charge of making sure that their, their veterans have some land somewhere. Um, it was very hard to give that land um, in Italy. There were, they did do that, but as the number of soldiers increases, particularly in the Second Punic War and later, just the amount of land that was required is enormous. Um, and so that was an advantage of having a presence in the Iberian Peninsula. There was just more land to give, um, particularly if you took it away from cities that had been loyal to Carthage. Um, the, the, as I said, the governance was um, done by two praetors. Um, these were elected officials that are holding an office just below consul. So it was a prestigious office. This was a, an important opportunity. It was a way of showing your, your talent for rule and giving you um, material when you ran for consul. Um, it showed, it, it gave you a kind of um, opportunity to show that you could govern successfully. Um, and so these were, this was an important um, settlement and these praetors wanted to do a good job. At the same time, it was a real challenge because Spain was in general quite resistant to efforts to Romanize. Um, they weren't really interested in becoming Romans and were quite happy. The Romans essentially figured out that the best way to incorporate these cities was just to maintain the status quo, to keep a Roman presence there, but for the most part, let them go on living as they had lived previously and to try not to enforce significant um, lifestyle changes, cultural changes. So Rome in Spain in the mid-150s, um, serious military conflicts with two native Spanish tribes. Um, so a lot of the cities, um, particularly in the south of Spain, were not all that keen to be Romanized. But in the north, where we have the Lusitanians and the Celtiberians, they, the Romans encountered significant military resistance. Um, so they were investing quite a lot of resources just in holding on to their position in Spain. Um, but over time, they come to see that, that Spain can be a valuable um, property, that, that it can provide wealth, um, that it can fund various activities for Rome. And Rome starts to exploit the natural resources of the area um, and starts to um, enforce um, taxes, regular taxes. So. Among these include the 5% of grain or a fixed payment. Um, and this is the first time that they do this. When they conquered cities in Italy, they never required a kind of regular annual payment. They will, in fact, as they conquer cities around the Mediterranean, it will become a regular pattern that they require some kind of annual tax. And one of the issues will be how to collect that tax. Um, the Romans also start to mine silver and other minerals. Um, this was something that the Carthaginians had been doing, and the Romans really sort of um, bring over tons of slaves, lots of people to work the mines, and we're in fact told stories about how they would make them work, you know, just ungodly hours um, until they just basically keeled over. Uh, but they recognized that, you know, for all the problems that Spain presented, it also had these, these incredible advantages. Um, and this is part of what starts to, to fuel the creation of Roman settlements in Spain. 